How many of you know the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of power? If there's no power, it's no gospel at all. I was raised up with a powerless gospel. Did not have power to do a whole lot except maybe get me in heaven. And boy, was I excited to know I did not have to live the way I had lived all of my life. So I was a believer for a lot of years and terrified at night, terrified to be alone. I had a lot of other issues, and I was told I was okay because I was a Christian. But when I began finding out that the gospel that saved me also can heal me and deliver me, I was so excited. And so it's with that zeal that I want to come to you today. And when I found out about deliverance, the, God, the ministry of deliverance is a ministry of miracles. Isn't that wonderful? We have seen so many miracles. And guess what? If you came for a miracle today, you may as well reach out and grab it. Right, Claudia? Okay, you can be free. And you know what else? You can also help to see the captive set free because as a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the authority over the enemy and you have the authority just as much as I do to command the enemy to stop and go away, <laughs> not just stop and go. But I do realize that some people have a passion and others don't. For example, in my household, my husband is a musician. When he's experiencing worship. He loves to pour out. He loves the ministry of deliverance, but he doesn't eat it, eat it, breathe it, and drink it like I do. You know, he loves to hear a good story, but um, he, he knows he has the authority, but it's not in his passion to do so. Unfortunately, a lot of times in the church, somebody will have a passion, and you think everybody should have that passion. You know, you have somebody that loves to knock on doors and say, hey, how are you doing? Come to church. I'm not signing up for that. I am mortified at thinking about that, but you just give me somebody manifesting a devil, and we're good. I'm ready to take care of that. So I'm going to appreciate the other giftings and talents and the other passions and let people flow where they want to flow, and you just let me flow where I want to flow. So I want to ask you just a few things. Even if you're in ministry, sometimes you'll have a passion. And so I want you just to raise your hands if, if you have this specific passion, Okay. Somebody tells you they have an issue with their marriage. You feel it in your heart. You're ready. You want to minister. You want to pray for them. How many of y'all have a heart for marriages? How about abuse? How many of you all, you just have a heart and a passion for people in abuse? What about people that's gone through trauma like um, divorces or anything like that? Does anybody have that passion there? What about the hungry? Does anybody just have a passion for those that are hungry? and don't have food or don't have means. What about foreign missions? Does anybody have a heart for that? Yeah. And so you're not bad if you didn't raise your hand. I may have not hit on the button, but aren't you so glad that the Lord just divvies out all of those passions? I have a passion for those that have miscarried, those that have aborted. I have a huge passion for those that are bound with fear or bound with infirmity. How many of you all love to pray for people that are sick? Yeah, so how about in jail or prison ministry? We have those. We heard a yay. See, the passion. Well, yeah, there you go. Okay, I'm so glad I'm with my right people this morning. That's for sure. Well, I do want to tell you just real quick before I start into this, um, I'm, I'm glad you all came. We, the th many of the resources are hot off the press. The red book that you've got, I don't even have one to show. Can you hold that up, Stacy? There. Um, that doesn't have a church name on it, but uh, it, we created that to be a guide. If you ever, um, have you ever seen a body of water that doesn't have uh, banks on it? You know what that is? It's a swamp. It may have some good things in there, but that's going to die and be stagnant. But you get some water with, a, with some boundaries, with some banks in there, it can live. You can take that water and make electricity out of it. Things that are alive can come alive in there. So what we do in creating the ministry isn't bondage, but it's just creating banks so that it can flow and come alive. Some of the things that we do as a team, um, rules we try to live by, like when we're praying for someone, let's say we have four people praying with one person to be set free, let's say, from the demonic. All four are not going to be screaming, come out, come out, come out. 
One person's going to command while somebody's going to pray. And we're going to do that orderly. We're putting the, can the other work? It can. But we find that there's certain banks that we have that makes it flow better. And so in that book, you're going to have a lot of information about the, the, the banks that we have here at this church. And at the end, I've got uh, 20 tips for deliverance that you can take a look at. Something weird happened, y'all, Thursday night. Super weird. So we had a women's night out. We went to eat at a restaurant that I never say the name right. El Tapatipa? What? El Tapateo? Well, afterwards, they have this holy guacamole, by the way. I asked for holy guacamole, extra holy. And afterwards, this does not sound like the truth, but Debbie, where are you at? She's one of our leaders, and our, you're always in that seat. I should have known. I don't know why I was looking elsewhere. Y'all want to find her. There she is, second row, first seat. She leaves the women's thing, and she said, you're not going to believe what happened to me. And she was this calm. You're not going to believe what happened to me. I said, what happened to you? She said, I pulled into the gas station. There's a man running across the, fire lot, the, the parking lot on fire. I was like, what's a punchline for this? So there's people filming it not helping this man on fire running. Debbie, I don't know where she got it, how she got it, but she's like, I've got to get my fire blanket. So she gets into her vehicle and she gets out her blanket. I don't know how you're going to chase a man on fire down, but she gets out. She's going to help. She gets her blanket and she's running after this man who's on fire. And eventually I think the guy comes out and puts him out. He's in critical conditions, what Amber told me last night. But anyway, I love the fact that she was prepared And the thing is, she didn't know that man. She just saw a man on fire. There were two people there that were filming it that had no emotion whatsoever, thought it was amusing. Now, the thing is, in this ministry, I don't think it's amusing when somebody's in bondage, whether they want to be or not. And so I want to come prepared no matter where I'm at. So we're doing preparation today. And I brought, this is actually mine, which is why it looks dilapidated. We made these packets up, and uh, we have them in the bookstore, but I, ha- I have this in my purse no matter where I go, and I use it more not for deliverance, and I do use it for deliverance if I need tissues or whatever. But we found that sometimes we're out or ministering to people and we don't have tools. <laughs> and as soon as we scare them, we say, come out. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it is a, a lot of times people, you start praying for them, they start overheating. It's got, a, it's got a fan in there. It's got tissues in there. It's got a puke bag in there. And uh, how many of you know that when um, you ever had something traumatic happen, it makes your stomach upset? It's not just because somebody is puking because they have d- something demonized. You know, if uh, lots of time, I've heard such bad news that it's made me nauseated. So we use these. They're good to put the tissues in if somebody does get sick or they feel like they're going to get sick. So this is the basic, my my fire blanket. And if you guys... Um, are t- want these they are we made them available back there just because we think that they're cool and then a lot of times when people are getting set free we'll go grab those those uh users weekly yeah it's weird how people know like we'll be praying for somebody and they just run to amber's bag and grab her things out of there um one of the resources because a lot of you all are in ministry uh, Amber does a class, very, very good class. How many of y'all been in the Set Yourself Free class at seven weeks? It's very good. How many of y'all been set free one way or another in one of those classes? Yeah. So we like a classroom training, and we have a bundle here. I'm not even going to pull it out, but it's got the three books that you use, and then it's got a USB drive with her PowerPoint, which has over 200 slides on it. It's a 32-gig drive. We have 10 of those back there, um, and you're welcome to those. And I want to make mention that Amber's book came out yesterday, The Spirit of Death. Congratulations, buddy. She and I have written together, but this is her first solo book. And we have, uh, some of y'all that know me know, I write one book at a time because I'm so scatterbrained. 
And in December, I think it was, the, I woke up and the Lord said, write this on the spirit of heaviness. And so I had to stop what I was doing. And I knew that I knew that I knew that God had interrupted my day, my time, my writing, because somebody was going to need that information. I wrote that book in a day, and it took a little bit of time to get it edited. But lo and behold, when it's done, a woman came into our church, and I'm going to probably talk to you about her during the spirit of error, but um, that had been broken. And uh, God said, let her, it wasn't even out in print, uh, let her read that. And I was like, there she is. There's the woman I wrote a whole book for. <laughs> and so... Um, we end, that book ended up coming out, and we're doing a whole series on Can I Be Set Free. So I'm very, very thrilled um, that this death thing is part of that series. The spirit of error is part of that series. Error is the one that about got me. But anyway, our pastor here says when you go into a setting like this to eat the chicken and spit out the bones... We may, and even in some of the classes, say some th something that you disagree with. Can you just take what you can and just kind of leave the rest of it? Yeah, <laughs> leave the rest of it. You may know how to do things better than we do. You may know how to handle specific things. And if you do, I want to talk to you about it. Y'all ever buy a hair dryer and it has the tag on it that says, don't use this in the tub? You're thinking, are only morons the one who buy your hair dryers? But obviously, there's a reason they've had to put this tag on, right? So I'm about to tell you some things you're like, really? You'd have to be a moron not to know this. Well, there, there's a reason I'm going to have to share some of this information. And it's, for some of you, it's going to be the equivalent of don't use this in the bathtub. So I want to talk to you about 10 issues that will destroy ministry, particularly with deliverance. How many of you all know that deliverance ministry can get out there fast and goes into Cuckooville? I've been in Cuckooville before. I don't want to go to that city any longer. So we're going to talk about that. Number one uh, issue that will destroy your ministry is if you have pride. And if you have, don't think you've ever dealt with it, you are steeped in it. When I found out I had pride, I was just appalled. <laughs> When God suggested that I had pride, I, could, I tried to rebuke him because I could not believe it. But once you get set free of that thing and you're aware of it, you probably will see it everywhere. But if you have pride and don't deal with it, you will hurt people. <laughs> Rick said, you'll be the only one who didn't know. When God starts showing him his pride, he came to me and he was like, Lisa, I'm starting to think this is an issue. And I was like, Rick. And he was like, I hope no one finds out. I said, you're the only one who doesn't know. <laughs> he was like, what? <laughs> it was too late to hide it. <laughs> he said, sometimes, this was not right now, but he's like, when certain people get in the pulpit, I just think that, you know, they're just not that educated and they don't know more. They, they, um, they don't know more than I know. I said, we know you think that. <laughs> but thank God you've been set free. <laughs> Okay, James 4 and 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. How are you going to be helping those that are broken? How are you going to cast out a devil? How are you going to impact the world if God's resisting you? So that's why I have pride is number one. And pride isn't just thinking you're better than everybody else. It actually could be thinking everybody else is better than you. It is a focus on you. In the handbook um, that I gave out to you all, I did a research of 39 men who fell. Out of those 39, all but maybe two or three were anointed at one time. I mean, with miracles and power and might, and then they fell. And you know the number one thing that was similar was that while they helped other people, they never got help themselves. And we are never too big and too great to not say, hey, I need to have prayer or I have issues and get help. Number two is disunity. And Pastor wrote a book on unity. Everybody in ministry needs to look at this book. But if you're out of sorts with leadership, family, or God, fix it before attending. doesn't mean you can't do ministry, but just fix it. 
You know, there's six things, now seven, that the Lord hates that are an abomination and in ministry and in life. We need to know what those are. You know, I need to know what Dennis dislikes, my husband. I don't need to be purposely doing those things. And when, if we're serving God and in fellowship with him, we need to know. He doesn't like a lying tongue, a proud look, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lives, and one who sows discord among the brethren. And so this sowing discord and disunity is a huge deal. If you want to flow in the Holy Ghost, some people think, I can't hear from God. Check your pride. Check your unity. See where that's at. Um, and another issue is a disconnect with God. We can't put him on hold. I remember one time I was ironing some clothes back when I ironed a lot. And the presence of the Lord came in. Now, listen, he often comes in when I am dressed like a hobo. I look like a hobo. He doesn't seem to care. When I was filled with the Holy Ghost, he broke my religious laws. I was an old pair of floppy shorts, looked crazy as a bed bug, and I could not believe he came in and filled me with the Holy Ghost looking just like that. <laughs> Apparently, he sees us in the shower, and he doesn't care. <laughs> so I, I'm ironing, and the presence of the Lord comes in, and I will, you, here's what I said. Hold on just a minute. I wanted to finish ironing. The king of kings, the man, the one who created the universe came in to visit me. And I said, just a second. Really? You know you're disconnected with God to when you're telling him, hold on just a minute. It's not hold on. I don't like to be told, wait just a minute, especially by children. If they're playing a game and I say something important and they're like, just a minute. I was like, there'll be no just a minute. Can y'all tell that I have been delivered from an attitude? <laughs> Keeping our prayer life in order, studying the word, and especially we need to make sure there's no unrepentant sin. Some people say, I don't think I can minister today because I'm having this issue with sin. I was like, is that something you're working on overcoming or are you unrepentant? Whole, two whole different things. So I'll work all day with somebody that's engaging with the Lord. To, but if you're unrepentant sin, I don't want you anywhere near me in ministry till you get that covered because you're not hearing from God if there's unrepent. Sin should make you sick. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. If we really believe that death was attached to what we're doing, there's no way we would do it. So it's unbelief is mixed in there with that. Also walking in forgiveness and obedience to the Lord. Now there's... Um, one sign of being disconnected to him is saying no to him. And Colossians 1 and 10, it says, increase in the knowledge of God. And that's why I recommend even when you're in a service, if when you are, some people can't take notes and think at the same time. But we created sermon notes for men and women back there just because I like to take the notes and then read them the next day. If, if I'm going to spend, my time is important, if I'm going to spend an hour listening to somebody, then I'm going to go over that later and make sure I've gleaned everything that I can out of that. So I think that's good. Number four, unteachable. Aren't unteachable people the worst? You can't tell them anything. <laughs> it's a sign of error. And then rebellion. I have been dealing with rebellion this week, but do you know the Bible links rebellion with witchcraft? How are we going to be connected to God or be in ministry if we're rebellious? Nobody can tell us what to do. Now, I want to talk to you briefly. I'm going to cut into this message to talk to you about pain responses because, um, well, let me read these scriptures. Proverbs 3 and 11, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor detest his correction. And I, when I first got into this thing, no one could tell me anything because I knew all there was to know. When I woke up this morning, I was like, God, the more I know you, the more I know I don't know anything. My husband said, and you don't know the half of that. <laughs> That's why you smart off to people in the morning. <laughs> First Samuel 15, 23 is the one that says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Doesn't that hurt? Let me tell you, there are specific pain responses that you might have or people might have in ministry. So let's say that you're ministering to someone and they begin to have an attitude or you begin to have an attitude. One thing people do is run, run away. You know, the Lord begins dealing. We have people that cycle through the church 
and they'll come and be great until God puts his finger on that one thing and then they head out. And they'll, they'll do their thing for a while. They'll come back in. They're doing great. God will put his finger on that one thing and then they run out. Running has become a process for them. When people run away from you, it's best not to get offended. Just know you've hit a pain point that the Lord needs to set free. Uh, other, how many stuff are, how, how many runners do we have? So we keep an eye on y'all. Okay, no running. And especially, I can feel it when it comes into the room. I like somebody is wanting to run, and then pretty soon you'll see who it is. Phew. One girl who was getting set free, she, had, she dreamed of murdering people every night. She was vile to her family and would come to church and look all righteous. And whenever I started dealing with this, she, she, she got mad and she left. And then she'd gotten so much freedom, she showed up in my office a few minutes later and she went, I don't even, I'm just used to running. I don't even know why I ran out the door. Can we just finish this? <laughs> I was like, okay, at least she grew to that. And then there's some of you and, that are stuffers. You just stuff it down. And if something bad happens, you just stuff it. I'll, either I'll deal with it later or it never gets dealt with. Tammy's shaking her head, yeah. And those are the people that you often need a bag with because the stuffers don't know that eventually that has to come out. You can ask God just to make it disappear, but you put it there. You need to allow that to come out. There was a man who had all, I don't know, everybody in his family talked about, he had a, just a vile mother. She didn't take care of him. She would leave him with uh, drug lords. She would do all these bad things. She abandoned him for years at a time. But if you were to talk to him, he was like, I just had the best mother. And his wife was like, I'm not, I don't know where he gets this. Because it was his coping mechanism. If he believed it was okay, then it was okay, and he didn't have to deal with that. So we're dealing with him back here in this prayer room. And I, I kept hearing um, call out the name of his mother. And this tip you've probably heard me say, you know, the spirit of Jezebel is not this queen in the Bible spirit coming back to haunt people. The spirits that inhabited Jezebel, manipulation, control, witchcraft, that was a combination. So when we say uh, we command Jezebel to go, we're not saying that old queen to go. We're saying everything that was in Jezebel, loose them. And so the Lord was saying to me, call out the name of his mother. So I said, what's the name of your mother? And he told me. And I just obeyed the Lord. And I said, okay. Everything that's come in because of this mother, let's say this wasn't her name. Let's say it was Martha. I was like, Martha, come out now. He immediately got sick. And thankfully, we had a trash can. He began to throw up violently. Some of it was spiritual, but a lot of it was the fact that for 30 years, he'd pressed and pressed and pressed. And the knowledge he was, he truly was not loved came in. At the same time, that knowledge from heaven came in that you are so loved and you're wanted. So as he's getting rid of this stuff, the Lord is coming in and healing him. I've never, listen, I've never seen a trash can more full. I think some of it was spiritual, but I think a lot of it was just dealing with that trauma. And when he finished, he went, I am light and what in the world just happened? So then you have to train those people because they're used to stuffing. That's why our job isn't just done whenever they're getting set free. You say, we turn around and find a new way of dealing. If you're a runner, like that girl, she's like, I don't even know why I'm running. If you're a stuffer, you have to be aware. If you're a disconnector, a disassociator, then you got to learn ways to not do that and lean into the Lord. Some people will use a vice. It could be smoking. It could be food. It could be drugs. It could be relationships, and you don't know why you're doing it. Well, it's because all your life that's what you've run to, and it's become an idol. So we have to train people to say, okay, let's seek the Lord. The Holy Spirit really is a beautiful comforter, and he will comfort. Some people medicate. And medication, you ever see the movies where people are, have a, the gallon of ice cream at the end of the day? Medicating with a, how many of y'all ice cream medicators do you have in here? <laughs> and then some people just simmer. They're just thinking on it. They're, they never get over it. They just continue to simmer. And they can become bitter. Some people, there's just an, they don't stuff it. They just have an outburst of violence. And they're like, once I get it out? Well, the problem is, once they get it out, they've spewed that on absolutely everybody else. That's not the way God wants us to handle it. 
or we can take it to God and we can go low. The most humbling you'll think, thing you'll do is to go low. When somebody corrects you in public, when somebody tells a lie about you, when, when somebody else gets the job that you wish you'd had or when God begins to deal, we can go low and take it to God. So the best counsel I could give you all day today is get the truth even if it hurts. And if you're ministering to somebody, if you can get the truth in even if they're spitting it out, the Lord can take the truth and begin, this is the, the Bible says it's the truth that sets the captive free. So for that man I was just talking about, I could not say, hey, listen, she's abandoned you, blah, 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 and given all the evidence. That's not what he needed. That really wasn't the truth. That actually was a perversion of what his life was. But if you can find the truth, and how do you find it? It's not what's in your mind. You ask the Lord and say, God, what is the truth in this situation? When you have difficult times um, setting people free or you, can't, you feel like you're not advancing, you probably believe a lie. And so if you begin saying, God, give me this truth, you will find that a seed of truth will begin to work its way, and before long you will be set free. I love it. Um, number six, mistake is it's not you. Focusing on your own abilities or the lack thereof will produce unneeded pressure. Y'all know who um, Alexander Pagani is? Well, I went to this conference. I'd never seen him before. He's just a little dude. Do y'all know that? He's just a little dude. And with a big spirit. And I don't know a lot sometimes about people that's online and that kind of thing. But I went and I was with somebody who had a severe handicap and it was a parent. And I love her. But do you know how everybody would approach her? They would see her in her need and they didn't want to make eye contact at all. Alexander Pagani saw her and rushed up to her and was like, today is a good day for a miracle for you. And I thought, I like you. He didn't try to abuse her or assume she was there for what he could see. He just loved on her. And we had somebody, and we love praying for people here, but we had somebody come up in a wheelchair, and Amber's the head of the prayer team, and she asked five or six people, I don't remember how many, to go pray, and they're like, no. I'm like, at the river? Really? What in the world is going on? Because we can become intimidated when we think the power to do the miracle is on us. Oftentimes, people just need love, y'all. And so it doesn't matter how complex or how little it is. You can pray and leave your prayer at the feet of Jesus. If somebody comes up and they get totally set free and they're screaming the victory, guess what? We did not do that. The power of Jesus did that. And the moment we start thinking that we somehow have that responsibility, we will go into error. But at the same time, if somebody comes up, let's say that they come up in a wheelchair and a, uh, and a deformity, and we pray and they wheel back, you know what? We still didn't do that. We have trusted in God. Sometimes people get healed slowly. Sometimes they might wake up the next morning. Sometimes they may have just needed people to say, we love you, and not make them a demonstration we have somebody that just came out of an alternate lifestyle and she was terribly broken and she came in and got saved and then she got filled with the Holy Ghost and she was set free and you know what I told her? I said, you know what, honey, we're not going to make a poster child out of you. We're going to allow you to heal. We could. I mean, she's had so many miracles. We could put her face on the flagship and say, all y'all come, but she's not healed yet. And there will come a time where she cannot hold that testimony inside of her, but we can't abuse the people that we're trying to set free. The seventh thing is hiding. Sometimes people keep it secret, but sometimes people in ministry don't tell others what they're going through out of shame, out of um, don't want other people to know out of pride. And we have to have a group of people that we can expose it to. This week I exposed a sin. I, I didn't accidentally do it. I did it on purpose this past week. And we were in prayer room and I felt it. And I was like, I cannot. I did something. The Lord showed me not to do it. I did it anyway. And you cannot fool around with iniquity like that. That's purposeful sin. And y'all would think that's not a big deal. He told me not to do it. I don't care if it's not to pick up an ink pen. I did it. And the consequences of sin are so severe, so severe, I don't care if you're 
you know, the president or the king or the pastor or whatever. If you have sin in your life, you have to get that out if you're a believer. So hiding the sin only produces bitterness. It only produces darkness. And I've found that people that have shame in hiding it, the only way to get it out is bring it up to the top. And usually it's not as bad as you think, but the Lord will scoop that out. Not trusting God is number eight. Now, we can rest in him that he is the boss of your deliverance and those you're ministering to. He's the boss of the orchestration, of the navigation. That means getting everything together. Guess what? He probably orchestrated getting you here today. And the people you impact later, he's going to get them. He's going to orchestrate that. And then the navigation would be, how, how you're navigating through your freedom. A lot of people get very upset that their freedom doesn't happen. Yeah, it can happen in a second. It really can. But for people that are broken particularly, it can take a bit of a process. And there was a girl yesterday, and she's like, I'm just done. I just want to be done. Yet there's something in her hand she doesn't want to give God. So I used to think God was the God with a sledgehammer waiting to pour it down on her head. He's not. He's like, with a child, give me what you can give me, and I'll show you that I'm trustworthy, and then you can give me more when you're ready. And so they learn in that process, I can trust him. And so it's a beautiful thing, but it can be frustrating to want it all in one whack. But God knows best, so we can trust him with that navigation. And then we can trust him with the demonstration. A lot of people are at the beginning, especially, are like, I want to be free, but I don't want to be coughing. I want to be free, but I don't want to throw up. I want to be free, but not in front of people. You can, uh, here's who I love to minister to. I love to minister to people who are so tired, they don't give a rip. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it sounds like. I don't care who it's in front of. Give me all you got, Jesus. The five years that I dealt with a specific spirit that attacked my body, I could have been free at the very beginning. They had a man here from Africa. I don't think our church was ready for this. <laughs> but I was doing deliverance and stuff, didn't know I had pride at the time. And he called out, he said, anybody with breathing problems, come on up. So they come up, and instead of what we know, you graciously anointing with oil and say, be healed and we live. That's what we expected. No. He walked up to the first one. He goes, come out. Come out. Come out. Do you know they all got free from asthma and breathing disorders and was running around the church? What? But everybody else was like, I don't care what problem I got. I'm not doing that in front of everybody else. And God was sitting right over there. And they're like, do you have any muscle issues? Do you have any? I'm like, I do, but I'm afraid because I minister to people. I'm going to walk up and he's going to say, come out. And it is going <laughs> to. And so I stayed and I thought, <laughs> I thought, I'll just get some private prayer afterwards. And at the time, my muscles they were twisting. I was hurting so bad. I thought afterwards, I said, excuse me, sir. <laughs> he didn't have any time for me. I said, do you think, I don't think this is a spirit. <laughs> but could you just pray quietly? <laughs> Such an idiot. <laughs> After five years of torment, about four years into it, I thought, why is God not healing me? It is never his fault. And you will get people that are think, I've had people this week in my office, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing all that he's asked me, but God will not do this. I was like, well, right there is your problem. Self-righteousness, pride. God is, I could clearly see it wasn't the issue, but people can begin believing that. And I thought God was delaying. By the time that I went to a deliverance conference in New Jersey, I did not care. There are people in this room that have seen me um, go into that manifestation of my muscles contorting until I looked like I was deformed. It was excruciating. You take that enough, it'll be like, don't care. I don't care if it's a demon. I don't care if it's something in my body. And I don't care who's looking at me. So I'm with 300 other ministers. And this guy finishes early and he's teaching on healing through deliverance. 
And I believe in that there are bodies and minds that just need to be healed. I also believe that a spirit of infirmity can cause sickness. And sometimes I think it's both. So they called up everybody. They said, like, it's not a stub toe, but if you've got something you know you can't get rid of, come on up. And I, almost 100 out of the 300 ministers got up. And when I was walking, I was like, oh, man, this is about to get messy. But I said, God, I don't care. If I'm growling, I don't care. If I'm puking, I don't care. If he calls me out in front of everybody, I don't care. I just have to have you. I have to be free. And I was standing and I was wait, not wanting it, but willing. That's, <laughs> and I'm standing like this and they began coming by. And when they got to me, they prayed some kind of cockamamie prayer. Didn't even make sense. I'm not an angry person. They prayed rage. They prayed all this stuff. But you know what? I was so desperate. I was like, bring it on. I don't even know what the issue, I don't care what they're praying. I'm just receiving from you. And then I waited. I was a little disappointed I didn't fall out. I was disappointed I didn't cough. I just stood there transformed. And God set me free. I've had a Charlie horse from time to time, but my body has not contorted. And um, freedom was worth standing in front of all those people and looking like a blooming idiot. Don't care. So I could trust him to navigate. Now, he wants to do it the easy way, but if we would like to do it the hard way, he will allow us to do that. I was like a change on that policy, God. <laughs> if you could just whack me, that'd be good. So we can trust him, and you will deal with people that it seems like they're not getting deliverance. And if you're trusting in yourself, you're going to go home disappointed. Pastor told me one time, he said, you can do this ministry until you start taking it home and you think it's on you, and then I'm pulling the plug. I needed somebody in my life to keep me out of error. If you are a Lone Ranger and you think that you can do this ministry all by yourself, you are headed for error and disaster. You must have the ability to have someone speak into your life and put some healthy banks in your life. And even if you disagree, you know, you, you have to be able to trust God enough to go into his presence and say, I disagree with this. I'm going to submit to this, but I need your wisdom. And then number nine, thinking you're God's gift to deliverance and that you know more than other ministries. Isn't that a thing, y'all? Well, this is the way that it's done. We had somebody um, from another team come here and um, flayed us for how we do it. Well, first of all, this is our house. And secondly, I felt like that um, they were doing it the hard way. <laughs> but I also tried not to rise up in pride and go, you know what? I probably could learn something from them. And this is where they're at. So we had to put some things in place. But it reminded me of this guy that I love to watch on the reels on Facebook. I don't do a lot of media, but I would love to watch reels. And do you know, one reels doesn't seem to be enough. It's like you watch it. I'm going to watch this for three minutes and you look up and spend two hours. Well, there's these two guys from the UK. They're British, of course. And they will come to America, and they'll, they'll state the, the differences. I love to watch that. And this guy, he said, let me show you the difference in America houses. So he walked over to an outside air conditioner unit. He said to the Brits, he's like, guess what this is? You'll never guess because they don't have air condition over there. This big thing outside their house has a purpose. It's air conditioned. I was like, really? And then he opened the screen door and he said, look at this, y'all. They have two doors going into every house, a clear one and then a regular one. <laughs> and I was like, really? And then he went into the bathroom and he said, they have electrical sockets everywhere, even in the loo. It's like, where do you plug in your curling iron or your, or, or your hair dryer before you get in the tub, you know? <laughs> And I can't say anything, any of that is wrong. It's just different. We have a word in our language that he would not even repeat it. And I'd heard him say a, a word before. I thought, I'm not repeating that word. And the word like fanny pack is a very bad word. Yeah, he wouldn't even say fanny pack. They call it a bum bag, which I think it was worse. 
So I got to thinking about that. That's the way it is in deliverance ministry. You know, somebody will do something and you're thinking, I'm not doing, no, I'm not doing that. And then you'll do it. And they're like, I can't even believe you said it that way. But what I found is like in this environment, if we will just get together and have iron sharpening iron and do things better, the man that's coming in August, I found him uh, online. He's from Indianapolis. So we became friends. And when I get stuck with something, I don't just twiddle my thumbs. I don't try to take advantage of it, but I'll text him. I'll say, Kevin, this is what's going on. And then the other thing is listening to the Holy Ghost when other ministries come in. Now, we'll back up and say when we started doing ministry here, Pastor Jones uh, found this book, and he said, take a look at this because it was, I don't know if any of y'all know Bill Suddeth, who's passed away now, but he gave me this book, and I did not know that there were tons of people doing deliverance ministry. When he gave me that book and I found somebody who knew more than I did, shock and surprise to only me, (laughs) I began to go and um, he had training, so I went to it. And I was like, I just want to know all that you know. I didn't take everything that that he did, but I did begin to glean out the good and be glean out whatever I could practically use, and it became a resource. So if you find somebody doing balance ministry, I would write their name down and really get hooked up with that. And number 10, sometimes people don't get free, and we have to know that that's not God's will. And you have to know that the Holy Ghost loves you and loves the people you're ministering to more than you do. That's really hard to believe sometimes, He loves your children more than you love your children. If you see somebody and they're weeping and they're broken and they're telling you about awful things and you're thinking, I just want to help them, you know that God wants to help them more. And he's probably orchestrated for them to be with you. And I want to give another caution is that I think God removes the idolatry by giving us all a piece of the puzzle. There's some people that are that do spiritual abuse and that they find a person and they want to be the only thing to them. You know, I'm going to hear from God. I'm the only one who can minister. And if somebody else ministers, it's like, hey, that's mine. Get your fingers off of there. But oftentimes the Lord will orchestrate somebody telling them the truth. And I'm going to tell, tell this just about Amber. Uh, Amber tells the story, I think, in her book and maybe in the class a little bit, that uh, she is a therapist. She is a licensed, certified, um, what are you, social worker. And we wrote a book on eating disorders because she raised, she had an eating disorder all of her life. And then there wasn't a day that she didn't want to die. After she became a believer, she still had thoughts of suicide and death. She is, is it certified? in suicide prevention. A company has spent thousands of dollars for her to train other people on how to recognize suicidal thoughts, on how to know if, um, or what to do if they're in it. And she would train other people all the while every day wanted to die. And one day, I don't remember when it was years ago, she and I were talking and I said, do you know that you don't have to live like that? It was the first she'd ever heard of it. And she's like, what are you talking about that I don't have to live like that? Because I know that the enemy is, you know, Jesus is life. The enemy is death. And if we have those reciprocating thoughts of death, that's not God's plan for us. So what I did was I put that seed in. And then the Lord began to water this. And do you know, it wasn't long she started getting set free. But I'm not the only one. Pastor Jonah has ministered with her probably more than I have. Other people came in and ministered. And now, if you want to be set free from thoughts of suicide or a spirit of death, that's the woman to go to. Because God not only set her free, but redeemed it in a way she has such a compassion. She doesn't think about dying every day. She doesn't think about it would be better off if, if she were dead. She doesn't think about how or having those pictures of how she's going to do it. So we all have a piece of the pie, and maybe your pie is telling the truth. And how I know how to minister, this is my other most favorite tip, is 
if compassion rises up in me, I know I'm never more like Jesus than when compassion is showing, when humility. So if I'm near someone and I'm hearing a bunch of stuff, you know, you know when somebody needs to be set free. One of the questions we got was, how do you know if someone is demonized? Mostly torment, but anytime somebody is not living in the perfection that Jesus planned for them, they probably need to be delivered in some way. And by deliverance, deliverance is anything you can't do for yourself. You know, if you can't, you can't save yourself, you can't heal yourself, you can't set yourself free. But through deliverance, Jesus can do that. And so if you're in, if you're in Walmart or if you're talking with somebody today and suddenly compassion rises up, that is your indicator that God wants to do something. Now, it may just be show love. It may be to pray. Or God may be using you in that moment to do something. We had a situation where there was a woman in the back. It was a different church. And the Lord spoke to me. A compassion rose up. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. And the Lord said to me, and I don't hear him audibly, it's just like the knowing that I know, and said, go hug her, but don't say anything. Like, I'm going to look weird, you know, because it's all about me. And he said, go hug her, but don't say anything. And so I walked over to her, and I'm kind of awkward. I'm not a real huggy person. I will hug you, but I'm not, that's not my love language. And I reached over, and I put my arms around, and I thought, well, I'll just say I love you or something like that just to make this less awkward. And right when I'm about to do it, the Lord says, and don't say anything. (laughs) Because he knows me. So everybody's being normal, and I'm back doing this. To a woman I don't know, saying nothing. And I thought, I'll just hug her and release it. And the Lord's like, no, stay there. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to explain why I'm staying here. And he said, and don't say anything. (laughs) So I am in that awkward position for a long time. And she's like stone. Yeah, it's one thing when they hug you back and cry. It's a whole other thing when they're giving you this. It'd be like me walking over there and hugging that railing and just hugging it in front of y'all. And I hug that railing and I hug that railing. And then before long, the shoulders started doing this. And the Lord was like, don't say anything. I'm like, oh, man. And starts doing like this. And then she begins to weep. And God begins to move. And I thought, this is the end. I can say something. No. I can't even explain. Hey, you're experiencing God because I listen to him. Get me some credit before I go home. (laughs) So I quit hugging her and walked away. Well, I got a phone call the next day, and I thought, here it comes. I'm going to be in trouble. And a woman who was her mentor and said, I just want to tell you how much that my friend appreciated you. (laughs) It's like, I thought I was going to get it because I was weird. And she said, she was sitting there, and she said, God... I am so broken. I am so tired. But if one person says anything to me, I'm out. And she said, and then you just walked over. You never said anything. She was waiting for you. You never said anything. And then she had an encounter with God. And I was like, God, you do know what you're doing. Go figure. And then for myself, I was in Texas at a conference that Bill Sedith had put on, and (laughs) this woman just walks up to me. I, this time, was a recipient. Recipient? Reciprocant. I knew something was wrong. And she said, Lisa, when you were walked through trauma with somebody else, who walked with you? And it was the first time I realized, "Mm, nobody did. And she said, well, the Lord says he wants to do a lot of stuff in you, but he can't because you've got all of this secondhand trauma. It's the first I ever heard that secondhand trauma was a real thing. You've got all this secondhand trauma in here. He wants to get that out. And I'm like, okay, you know, you can get that out. It's no big deal. So she's like, I've got a little music. And just like, you know, we come prepared with our stuff. We'll leave that there. She comes prepared with this little Bluetooth thing. She's like, let me just put on some music. She's excited. Like she's done this before. We're out at a picnic table out in the prayer garden there in Denton, Texas, and she puts it down, and she's like, okay, now, we're going to ask God. And I looked at her, and suddenly this pain I didn't even know was there starts creeping up. I'm like, oh. 
It comes up, and I started, I cried for three days, y'all. I did not know that was there. I had walked with my daughter who had been bound with an um, eating disorder and the spirit of heaviness, and I did not know how to help her until pastor gave me a book, and I learned about heaviness, which I'm going to talk about later on this afternoon. And I did not know that you can walk with people, even as a minister, and it do something to you. I poured that out, and I poured that out. I went back into class late, and, I'm, and she's just looking satisfied. <laughs> you're going to make a volcano over here and then just look like you're satisfied. But I want to know, you know, after that, God began pouring in wisdom. I could hear him better than I had before, and I didn't even know I was stopped up. But God knew, and he was in charge of the orchestration, the demonstration, and the navigation of my own deliverance and my own healing. And you've come today, and he's already in that process. Glory to God. 